This session is going to go over something called a time series design. Time series designs are critical to, to making changes in behavior of individual students. So this is really important in dealing with students identified uh, with behavioral or emotional issues in special education, but actually you can also do it with students who, who just having behavior problems uh, in a school setting. The most common type is something called a single case experimental design. And this is where you have one subject or maybe just a couple of people that you're looking at and you're trying to, to narrow down a change in a specific behavior and you want to know whether or not the thing that you're doing is making a change in that behavior. Um, this is much different than what we've looked at before where we're looking at large groups of people. This is looking at a very one, one very specific individual with a specific behavior problem. Um, you can learn a great deal about one to a few people, but that does have a drawback that we'll see at the end of this. Um, questions asked, well, are these are average people. No, they're not. This, you know, you can deal with a group of people like in a classroom setting that are having behavior problems. But this is designed for that one individual that no matter what you do with the group, that didn't work. You've got to come up with something individually for that person. Um, they tend to be outliers, They're one extreme or the other. They, they don't fall into what we'd call a normal set of behaviors. We have to, in order to figure out whether or not what we're doing is going to work, we have to do something called a baseline. The baseline, basically what it does, it does is gives you a reference point of what is a normal set of behaviors for this child. Not normal in relation to everybody else, but what is the occurrence of a set of behaviors. Then you provide an intervention and measure the behaviors after that. But you have to spend a, a several days trying to establish a normal pattern for that person. The most common design is called an AB design. It's also known as a two-phase design. There's a what's called a no intervention baseline. You implement something and then you have an intervention phase where you're measuring what is going on. The downside of that, and I'm going to jump ahead one slide here. This is an A-B design. This has to do with study skills. So here's a situation where we are establishing a baseline, and that's before this point. This B line right here is where we have implemented our intervention. So we, we're getting a reading on how many minutes per, per day this person is spending studying, providing an intervention as goes up. The problem with this and being able to identify, identify what the true results are is there is an upward trend anyways. So it's really difficult to say whether or not what we did made a difference because it was heading up anyhow. So that's one of the problems with doing this. Oops. The other type that's a little more extensive is called a reversal design. And this is the same thing. It's a single case experiment design you establish a baseline, you apply a treatment, and then the treatment is removed. The change of the variable corresponds to the change of the treatment. The variable is assumed to be under the control. So um, there is a withdrawal part to it. There's no intervention phase, an intervention, and then the, the intervention is removed to see what happens. And what that does is it creates a more reliable relationship between the intervention in the outcome because if you can remove it and see that something is actually changing then you can more readily say that what we're doing seems to be making the difference. That's an ABA design. Very often you'll see a B put back into that. What we mean is AB, AB. A is a baseline, B is where the treatment's occurring, we remove the treatment and then we put it back in. Sometimes we do put it back in and the reason why is, is for ethics. If what we're doing is working, then we have an ethical responsibility to reintroduce that intervention again to see if we can change the behaviors in, in an appropriate way. So here's an example of an ABA design. We have, in this study, we have a situation where a client was not exhibiting the appropriate type of empathy reactions and they are trying to increase those. So we establish a baseline for five sessions where we determine what, you know, what type of empathetic reaction this person is having and they're averaging like 
10.8, something like that. Then we provide a treatment at B and start measuring those again. We continue to apply our treatment. And the average goes up to 14.8. We remove the treatment and we see that it goes, begins to go back down. So here's an example of where we've done an ABA and it looks like we are able to change some behavior here because we know that when we remove it, it goes back down. It's also a situation where it's important for this person to have appropriate empathetic reactions that we reintroduce the treatment again to see if we can get those to go back up. There is also something called a multiple baseline design. This is a single case experimental design in which some variable of treatment is applied and the treatment is applied to the same subject in a different setting to a different behavior or to a different subject. Um, for example, we have several options here. You know that very often in schools we have kids that have a number of behaviors that we're trying to fix. The, the issue with A-B designs is you can only change one thing at a time. You don't want to get in a situation where you're trying to change two variables and you'll see why at the end of this. So we may have one person has several behaviors we're trying to treat. So we start with the first baseline, start treating that, if we can get that to change, and then we introduce the, a second baseline if we were looking at the second behavior we want to change. That's multiple baselines. We, we have several behaviors we're working on. The other situation, and you've all heard this before, so sometimes we have one person who's having behavior issues in many different situations. It is in, it's a behavior issue in the cafeteria, it's a behavior issue in the classroom setting, it's a behavior issue on the playground, it's a behavior issue at home. You can only fix one thing at a time. If you're trying to change it all at once because the situations are different, the context, the contextual settings are different, then we might have to work on those one at a time. We see if we can get it set fixed in the classroom. Once that's working, then we start working on that same behavior in the cafeteria. Then we start working on that behavior in the playground. And then we start working on that behavior at home. So we end up with multiple baselines and we keep track of all that information so that we can see what's working and what's not. The other thing is if we have a small group of people, let's say we have a behavior intervention class or something like that, and we've got several students with the same behavior. We don't want to do this to everybody all at the same time if it's an experimental intervention. So we might try one behavior with one person. And if we have another person that has the exact same behavior, we could say, look, when we, the first time we did this, this seemed to work. So we want to try again with somebody else to see if it works. And you can e keep establishing multiple baselines to see whether or not your intervention works. I think this will become more common with RTI and things like that, where we're trying to change a common set of behaviors. The only way to see whether or not what you're doing is working is to keep track of this data. Um, here are just an overview of the different approaches, A, B, single subject, multiple baseline, the advantages and disadvantages to both. There's one called an interrupted time series and that is used to rule out, this is used to rule out long issues with time and it allows you to do a baseline, give it a while, and then come back and measure the baseline again. It's not as common as some of the other ones. Some of the limitations, um, it takes a long time to establish a baseline. You really have to watch behaviors, keep track of that. Um, and you have to eliminate that it is anything other than what you are doing. So you have to eliminate all these possible independent variables that might be contributing to the behavior. Um, if it is behavior that doesn't happen more than once a week, something like once every two weeks, uh, a kid just kind of, for lack of a better word, loses it every now and then, it's really hard to establish a low rate behavior like that and develop a baseline. It's easier when there are things that occur on a regular basis. When you're reading about these, or if you're trying to do a research study on something like this, the methodology has to be very long because you people have to really understand the situation 
in order to replicate it. Um, the problem with these designs is it is very difficult to, to generalize to anything else because we're working on individual behaviors. This is not really a research project in terms of whole groups, large uh, groups of teachers, students, things like that. It's really designed to get some statistical information about one individual's behavior. Therefore, because of that, his situation is very unique, your methodology has to be very well written. Um, the last thing is the context. It's very important to describe the setting, the people around it, um, and focus only on changing one thing at a time. This example I always use about this. One slide physics teacher working with students and they were studying the impact of changing conditions on the swing of the pendulum. And every time that she would do this, she'd have them change the length of the rod, which is the distance of the string between where it swings and the weight on the end of it. And she'd change the mass too. That's not okay. And they, they never could get the experiment to come out right because they were trying to change two things at the same time. That's the problem with single case designs, is you have to be very careful that when you change something that you're only changing one thing. Everything else remains the same, especially if you get into multiple baselines, that you work on one independent variable at a time to see whether or not it has a change in the dependent variable. That wraps up this session on time series designs, and you will see a couple of examples of these as well and we'll use this as the basis of a discussion thread.